Hi, everyone. I'm Marianne Watson, the Director of Resource Management and Description at Villanova University's Falvey Library. Um, John, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we are a private R2 university with just under 10,000 FTE. And today I'll be presenting with my colleague, John Benionis, our metrics and assessment librarian. Villanova began our campus-wide affordable materials initiative known as AMP or AMP in spring 2017. It's been a joint initiative between Falvey Library, the Center for Access, Success and Achievement, the Provost's Office and the University Bookstore. For this presentation, we'll focus on one program from our AMP initiative, the eBook Matching Program. This program matches available unlimited C eBooks from the library to the bookstore course materials list, as well as identify what the library can purchase to support the current semester. We'll discuss the history of the initiative and program, outreach and communication, our many workflow improvements, technical pieces to the program, and our assessment. The AMP project grew out of a collaboration with the Center for Access, Success, and Achievement, known as CASA. When CASA moved into the library's renovated Learning Commons area, a partnership was born. CASA had a print lending library of donated textbooks that they offered on a semester-long loan to Pell eligible students. The lending library has grown considerably, and the library was able to streamline operations by cataloging their holdings and facilitating circulation. The AMP initiative grew out of the realization that not only Pell eligible students struggled with course materials costs. It is now a collaboration between CASA, the library, the bookstore, and the provost office, as well as the Villanova Institution for Teaching and Learning. The AMP mission is to increase student and faculty awareness about strategies for obtaining the best course materials that are most affordable. We have an evolving e OER promotion program and the library ebook matching project. AMP recently launched an OER adoption grant program and gave out five awards this year. We hope to continue the program in the coming years, and you can learn more about our other programs on our website. All of the AMP initiatives require some form of outreach or communication. A liaison librarian takes the lead to finalize acquisitions decisions and coordinates with other liaisons on purchase decisions. They also communicate to faculty and students on ebook matches each semester. We improved our communication uh, an outreach for the ebook matching program over the years. At first, faculty were notified that the library could supply a course material to their students. Waiting for the faculty to reply slowed down the process, so we eliminated this step and created an opt-out form for faculty. Faculty also request course materials through their liaison librarian directly outside of the bookstore process, who then notifies the acquisitions department so the material can be added to the AMP database manually. In the first year of the program, most students were notified that they could use a library ebook, were not notified until well into the first or second week of the semester. This was extremely problematic. Uh, many students had made purchases and were disappointed. In the past few semesters, almost all notifications were made in the week prior to the first day of class. This was achieved by improving faculty compliance with book adoption deadlines and work process improvements that I will describe later. We've also adjusted the content of student email messaging to include information on how to annotate e-texts and to include direct links to the e-books in the email, as well as instructions on how to find them in our LMS. Over time, the responsiveness of the university's technology department who populates the courses with the links has improved as well. We have other outreach initiatives to reach the community overall. We rely on our website, e-newsletters to faculty, staff, and students, stakeholder communications from those like the provost office and the bookstore to faculty, emails sent directly to enrolled students, and sessions presented to campus or at departmental conferences and faculty congress. We aim for a multi-pronged approach for all of the initiatives to grow the audience that we reach. The initial blueprint for our ebook matching program came from an online presentation shared by Louisiana State University. Louisiana was matching ISBNs of books reported to the bookstore to ebooks offered by major publishers to libraries with no digital rights management or with unlimited simultaneous users. At Falvey, we had the resources and technical know-how in place to replicate the Louisiana State University project. Linda Hawk, one of our research services and scholarly engagement librarians, brought the idea to G. Davis, our associate university librarian for collections and stewardship. 
G championed it by securing library leadership commitment for budget and staffing. Our initial launch was for the spring of 2017. At Villanova, the AMP ebook matching program matches available unlimited C ebooks from the library to the bookstore list. We also identify purchase options for titles on the bookstore list that we currently don't own or subscribe to. We have allocated $15,000 per year spread between the fall and spring. We began supporting any matches for summer semesters this past summer, but don't make any purchases. It took a few semesters to streamline our workflows. We needed a fast, streamlined way to identify, select, order, and process the ebook matches. Relying on static spreadsheets from multiple publishers, ordering from multiple vendors, and passing back and forth edited and updated spreadsheets was not efficient and data was getting lost. Data pulled from our catalog did not always indicate if it was an unlimited C ebook. And it was always fun to get a spreadsheet back with your filters gone and your sorting awry. We determined we needed to rely on our book vendor solely for ordering for the need for a quick turnaround. We have other vendors we can order from directly, but it is not a systematic process and did not have the fast turnaround we needed. Since the initial launch, we also transitioned to an MS Access database to store and add ebook matches and bookstore data. Each semester, we, want to re we run a match query on titles on the bookstore list, which pulls out what ebooks we've already have access to and can push to students and faculty immediately after link checking. For ebooks we don't have in our catalog, we identify what ebooks are available in unlimited seat format for purchase from our book vendor, Gobi, and we select the material to purchase based on the following criteria. The prioritized number of students affected, combining enrollment and number of courses and sections in which a given work is assigned, and we have a price cap of $250. DRM-free versions are preferred, and the lowest priced and limited seat ebook is purchased if approved. Titles that are not selected during this process can be purchased or shared with the subject liaisons for review and purchasing with their subject funds, but are also incorporated into the AMP program for outreach. We rely on Gobi for ordering due to the very fast activation for our access to the purchased eBooks. Once activated, we add the ISBN and URL information to the database and push out updated reports for student and faculty notification. Once matched, relying on the queries built in MS Access, information is pushed out to the appropriate team for specific data processing. The next steps are adding the material to the Blackboard course pages, adding to library e-reserves, and again, notifying the students and faculty directly. The acquisitions workflow has also improved over time. A form was created for liaison librarians ordering faculty requested eBooks for courses that activated adding the titles to the AMP database outside of the AMP process. Acquisitions also added fields to general order forms to help identify AMP matches and course information. Uh, there's a lot of dedicated staff time to this program. Uh, we have a developer um, in, within the library who updates the database for the current semester, updating the queries, pulls and loading data periodically from other systems like the bookstore list and the course registration data. A liaison librarian who reviews and approves purchases with dedicated AMP funding, emails faculty and students directly with ebook matches for their courses, and is the coordinator between the rest of the fund owners and acquisitions. Uh, the acquisitions department who confirm prior to matches, confirm prior matches by link checking, uh, pull ebook availability and pricing for unmatched titles, purchase the approved ebooks and manage the acquisitions and cataloging process and add the ebook information, the ISBNs and the links to the database, sending updated reports to others for outreach efforts. Our assessment librarian, after the semester ends, who prepares assessment, particularly estimated ROI for students. Our bookstore staff, who prepares and shares the bookstore list with the library. Our access services staff, who adds the matches to electronic course reserves. And then our university technology, who adds the matches to our Blackboard courses. Our workflow is extremely time sensitive. We try to process the bulk of the workflow within three weeks with some prep, prep work prior to and assessment after the fact. Our reliance on reusing data from prior semesters, mail merge for systematic outreach, reliance on our book vendor for quick turnaround and systematic acquisitions and cataloging processes and storing multiple data sets in one place to easily query all the data is extremely helpful for a nuanced and complicated process with multiple centers and departments involved. My goal is to continue our process improvements and reduce as much duplication semester to semester as we can while providing a quality service that our students and faculty value highly. 
The benefits of transitioning to an access database in queries are multiple. The data for multiple systems can be stored. The bookstore list, the course registration data, including number of students enrolled and faculty information, ebook information, and acquisitions data of the ebooks and purchased with AMP or subject funds. If titles are used in future semesters, they've already been matched in the database. The data from the bookstore can be easily enhanced with up-to-date course data from our course registration system. And we built multiple queries to incorporate exclusions at the request of indiv individual faculty that are excluded automatically. Some faculty still prefer print, and this is an opt-out program and the query helps us manage exclusions consistently. We can also manually add titles that the faculty have requested from the library for their courses that are not on the bookstore list. This is especially true for eBooks during the pandemic as faculty rebuild our courses around electronic resources. And we can build new queries as we see the need. Last semester, we started loading the acquisitions data for each semester to aid in the assessment process of eBook usage and ROI reporting and built queries to report out that ROI. We plan to import counter usage to the database to improve the ROI assessment process. Thanks, Marianne, for that first half. So I'll take it over now. I'm John Benionis, Metrics and Assessment Librarian. Uh, but first, I'm going to be talking about um, some of the technological improvements that were carried out by uh, Chris Halberg, our technology developer at the library and the lead programmer for the AMP program. In order to carry out uh, the ebook matching, uh, we needed to compare hundreds of thousands of books and looking at all the materials that students needed for their classes. All the books we had in the library, and then all the books, ebooks that were available from multiple pub publishers. So Chris uh, wrote a Python script that looked for matches across all the available data. And while that did work, the matching only updated uh, when the program was run, and the inputs were only updated when they were sent to Chris, who then had to fit those updates in his own schedule. And every time there was a special case or new exclusion, it required the rewriting of the existing program or the creation of a new program. So because we needed that quick turnaround rather than a bottleneck, uh, oops, sorry, we developed, um, uh, sorry, we developed a um, MS Access database. And with everyone editing and referencing that shared database as an access file on Dropbox, everyone was then working with updated queries and the data was always up to date. So with the new system in place, the specialized Python programs now only handle the most work intensive information. And then these outputs are added to the shared database. This is much more flexible as team members can now edit the source information while everything is kept up to date. And the access reports can be run at any time, which allows for immediate turnaround. And special cases now only require changing some filters instead of running an entirely new program. Any additions to the database are shared and referenced by all of the reports. And these updates are seen by all AMP team members and incorporated into those reports immediately. So as a result of these changes, we're having more matches each semester and decreasing the need for some purchases. Uh, so this approach essentially just allowed us to be much more agile and be better informed uh, about the process and then largely remove that dreaded bottleneck that we were having in the past. So moving on from technology, my own contributions to the AMP program have revolved around uh, measuring our library's return on investment for AMP. First, uh, we recently completed our triennial community survey right before the pandemic hit. And this was sent to both faculty and to students. And we asked about all the different services and programs that the library offers. Uh, and specifically though, we asked about awareness and importance of those programs. And for AMP, about half of the faculty reported awareness uh, and roughly a third of the students said that they were aware of the program. So that's a little lower than we'd like to see, but I think awareness uh, in, has increased generally for students, obviously, who've been further along in their studies at Villanova. But nonetheless, the survey itself served as an educational tool in boosting awareness by just reading about the program itself. But as for importance, uh, both faculty and students uh, recognize the value by um, ranking AMP in the top five of more than a dozen library programs and the students ranked AMP in the top two. And in addition to that, we also received many positive comments at the end of the survey, uh, specifically mentioning about how helpful AMP has been for them. So that's you know, a real clear affirmation of our efforts. Another way that uh, we measure value is recognizing, as Marianne mentioned, that many of the titles purchased in the program can be reused in future semesters. So even though uh, we only purchase an ebook once, 
As long as that same ebook is being used in a future class, the savings can continue on across multiple semesters. And this phenomenon can be seen in the charts on the following two slides, which will cover usage of the AMP books and uh, potential student savings. So this chart shows the total number of titles in the program for each semester in the blue bars with the dark blue representing titles that went used and the light blue representing titles that were unused. Over time, the total number of titles in the program has increased uh, even though our budget for purchasing has remained the same. And again, this is because of the ability to reuse titles in future semesters, so we have a cumulative effect. And as awareness of the program has increased over time, the number of unused titles has decreased now to less than 8% of the total titles in the program that were used in spring 2020. As far as number of downloads, uh, after a very solid start in spring 2018, we then saw this huge spike in downloads during fall 2018 and spring 2019. And this was primarily due to uh, huge numbers of downloads from just a few titles that turned out to be extremely popular. So we saw those usage numbers come back to earth during fall 2019, uh, but then it's still a very solid level. But then in spring 2020, we saw usage shoot up again. And that was largely due to the pandemic when all of our ebook usage saw a huge increase because of going fully online. However, uh, not all usage is created equal. So, uh, so this next chart will illustrate essentially the long tail of our usage for the AMP ebook titles during each semester. Uh, so uh, looking at just the top 30 titles with the highest use and representing that each title's use as a percentage of the semester's total usage, um, it yields a pretty similar decay curve in the usage distribution among those ebook titles for each semester. And notably, the curve will begin to flatten around 3% of the total usage, but only approaches 1% of total usage at the very end of this data sample. And you know, taking that with the previous slide, the, the approximate minimum of 10,000 downloads per semester, and even more than that, uh, this it would indicate that many titles below those top 30s were still recording more than 100 downloads per semester, which is indeed what happened. And across the different semesters, it really isn't until the top title number 40, number 61, 71, and 90, that uh, less than 100 downloads uh, ended up being recorded. And finally, when it comes to uh, measuring ROI, uh, here we can see what the library has spent on AMP eBooks in the very small blue bars compared to the calculated potential student savings in the red bars, uh, with the dotted lines showing the cumulative spending and savings. So first, it's important to note that we are only counting purchases made with allocated AMP funding in our cost calculations for that semester and not including titles that were already previously owned or already available via a subscription package. As for the student savings, uh, we take the number of students enrolled in the course uh, multiplied by the bookstore used price. And so while this certainly provides us with a maximum potential student savings, since it's difficult to impossible to know just how many students may have used the AMP books instead of purchasing their own copy. Uh, and we're looking at the bookstore sales data isn't helpful either since students uh, could purchase the books from anywhere. It still gives us uh, a, a reasonable estimate of, of the savings. But even so, using this method, uh, it demonstrates a cumulative savings of more than $700,000 from the course of the program as of spring 2020. So we're pretty pleased with that number. I also looked at other ways to calculate that savings number, uh, since that is kind of like a maximum potential. Um, so first, the, the first line, the, aren't, uh, you know, the dark orange line is the maximum that we talked about in the last slide. But then the second line uh, excludes any zero use titles from the savings calculation. So um, that reduces the savings by roughly about 13% over the course of the program. But if you wanna be even more conservative about it, um, if the number of downloads is less than the course enrollment number, uh, we would adjust the enrollment number downward to that usage number and use that as the multiplier against the used bookstore price. So for example, if 25 students were enrolled in the class, but the course ebook only had five downloads, then five would be used as the multiplier since no more than five students could have accessed it at any one time. Um, but this method still only reduces by about another 13% since as I showed on the other slide, most of our titles have reasonably high usage. So there's obviously many ways to calculate this number and to argue for the best way to approach it, but our yardstick approach with the maximum student savings 
Uh, with that, we've had a return on investment of about 16 times, but even the most conservative approach here has our savings exceeding our cost by more than tenfold. So quo vadis or ubi imus hink, where will we go from here? Um, so for the first time this past summer, as Marianne had mentioned, uh, we, ran our <clears throat> we ran the matching uh, to our existing AMP titles and uh, completed outreach to students through Blackboard and emails, uh, but we did not make any additional purchases. This was just a simple way for us to expand our reach without needing any uh, further financial commitment. Um, in the near future, something I'd like to do is convene a student focus group to get an additional AMP data set specifically on student purchasing habits since, as we kind of mentioned, due to privacy, we don't know exactly who's downloading these ebooks that we're recording usage for, whether they're in the course, whether the user's in the course or not. Uh, so by surveying a sample of students in AMP-supported courses um, to ask about their actual participation levels in the program, that would help us provide an even clearer sense of the savings. Another thing we're uh, currently doing is marking AMP titles as subscribed versus purchased, actually with some help from some virtual student workers this semester and then loading these statuses into uh, the access database. And then the next step would be to identify any high use subscribed titles for a perpetual access purchase. We'll also keep up our continued outreach uh, through our faculty campus currents, student newswire, messaging through the various college deans on uh, our OER and other affordability options so that we can continue to increase awareness and uptake in the program. And we're also pleased to know that starting in spring 2021, the bookstore will actually be adding AMP availability to the course section notes on the bookstore website. So this will actually help to address the issue in which students you know, may have purchased a book before receiving the email from the library, that the title is gonna be available electronically through the library. And uh, this will especially help for titles that were already purchased in a past semester and identified as a match. Uh, well, new purchases that we make in spring 2021 might not be available soon enough for that specific notification, but it's still a step in the right direction. And finally, uh, the members of the AMP committee continue to meet regularly throughout the year uh, to kind of hear about any updates from student support offices. And, and these discussions that we have do allow us to brainstorm on additional ways that we can help support student access and affordability for, for course materials. So with that, uh, we really thank you for your attention during our presentation and while we shared our successes and future plans for the Affordable Materials Program. And now we definitely uh, wanna hear from any questions you may have about the project. So we have a few that came in. Uh, the first one that I see is, do you find many titles that are only available as eBooks to students, but not licensed to libraries? Uh, I can answer this one. Uh, I, I tend to process the unmatched eBooks to see what's available in Gobi, and I tend to work with a list of about 1,500 lines. There are some duplicates in there, and I find that we discovered a couple hundred that are available through Gobi, not that many. Um, and this is consistent semester over semester, so we're not able to support all of the course materials on the bookstore list, um, but we have, as you've seen, seen that we have seen success to at least support the the students of the ebooks that were able to license through Gobi. Um, another question came in. Uh, you say you buy unlimited access ebooks from Gobi. What if the title is only available as one or three user? And this person has many questions. Um, why would faculty want to opt out of the program? I'll, I'll answer the first one first. <laughs> We do support um, one and three user available eBooks if that's the only uh, available eBook, if it's requested by the faculty, but that's treated outside of the AMP program. So the faculty can request that through the liaison librarian or um, can kind of work its way through access services to our liaisons and, and the library can choose to still support and purchase that eBook, but we just don't treat it as an affordable materials program eBook. Um, and the access, the, the titles are still cataloged, and the requester are still notified that the ebooks are available for access for the students. Uh, why would faculty want to opt out of the program? We do have some faculty that prefer print for uh, their students. Um, we've seen this with a couple uh, higher level courses, graduate courses, um, and we want to respect that decision from their faculty. And we just needed to find a way to handle it consistently instead of remembering every semester, oh, right, um, Professor Smith did not want us to send the emails to his students. So 
um, using the, relying on the AMP database query really helps us um, not have to remember everything. So that's pretty exciting. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean that that would be restricted, that we would restrict students from accessing the eBooks if we had a, them available in our collection. The students can still find the content in our catalog in our discovery system. Another question is, uh, has there been any pushback from the bookstore and how was this relationship managed? It's been an extremely positive relationship with the bookstore. Um, it's an interdepartmental um, committee on campus and the bookstore is heavily involved in our brown bag sessions uh, regarding OER promotion and AMP promotion. Um, we are actually pushing faculty to the bookstore to list their course materials with them because that's how the process gets kicked off every semester. Um, and we are also feeding information back to the bookstore so they know what, what resources that we're supporting to help their ordering levels as well. Um, and it ha I haven't had any negative experience with that. It's been extremely positive. We feel very lucky. I know this is not the case at, at all universities and colleges. Another question is what, what percentage of books are you able to provide? I've made some efforts to do this for my subject liaison areas, but many books are not available in E. Has there been any effort to encourage faculty to assign only books available as unlimited user eBooks? And this goes back to, you know, we, we're really trying to provide content on a systematic, with a systematic approach. So if it is available from Gobi, um, we're able to purchase that. It's not gonna cover everything as I mentioned before. Um, and then we do have the liaisons uh, who are educated on this program and um, have close relationships relationships with our faculty um, who are promoting OER, are promoting other library resources that we have in our collection that can be outside of the AMP program, um, you know, to help them uh, create a better experience for their student relying with the faculty as a foundation for that learning. Uh, it seems like you also need to include library staff costs in your ROI calculation. John. That's definitely a good uh, a good point. I mean, it's where we're just looking at the the cost of the book itself, the purchase itself, versus the cost of the book for the student and through the used price in the bookstore. Uh, but but for sure, as as you know, Marianne demonstrated, there's a, quite a process involved in, in how we do this. Now, while we have streamlined it quite a bit from the beginning, there is still a fair amount of staff time. You know, put to, in the first couple of weeks of the semester or, or right beforehand as we get that going. So. We could try to quantify that that number and, and come up with something and have like as a kind of secondary uh, uh, reference to kind of you know temper that ROI. But but even so, I think we'd still be far and away you know ahead of our overall investment in terms of what we're seeing in savings. But that's a really good point too that it's not just the purchase. Obviously, you know there's some effort and, and staff time that goes into that too. Another question is, do you purchase books for classes where access, access codes for homework platforms or other courseware are also required? Uh, we purchase whatever matches we can find through Gobi or are available in our ebook subscriptions, but we cannot support at this time um, and any access codes availability or accessibility. Uh, that's a barrier we are discussing in the committee to see if there's other things that we as a committee and us as a library can, can try and uh, help students with, but we don't have solutions to that yet. Um, let's see, another question. We've attempted to run a similar program and the largest issue has been getting faculty to select and report their course materials in a timely manner, manner. Has this been an issue you encountered? And if so, how do you resolve it? This is an issue that we've encountered and we um, uh, promote our bookstore and, and course adoption deadlines um, through multiple channels. Like I mentioned earlier with our outreach through the faculty um, email newsletter, through the, through the deans, um, through our liaisons directly contacting the faculty, through the bookstore reaching out, um, as well as um, the provost office. We really try and remind, remind, remind that the course adoption deadlines are extremely important uh, for the students as well as for this AMP program. Another question is, how are we handling course materials that have individual publisher worksheets, et cetera, along with the textbook? Uh, we are um, really only supporting through the AMP program, the Unlimited C ebook program. So there's no worksheets uh, available in these ebooks that we're supporting. So we're not handling it yet. Again, another barrier we, we'd like to resolve in the future. Another question is, is there any resistance to releasing course registration lists and students' names? 
we don't load this information, the, the um, student information into our database. We really only load the courses, the sections, the faculty, and then the um, student enrolled course related distribution list. So there's no identifying information for the students within our database. So it's all anonymized. Um, how strictly are you matching titles from previous purchases if additions differ or anything else? Uh, we do uh, rely on the, the alternative um, searches and go based on the ISBN. Um, so we also take a careful eye to see if it's the same edition because we really want to support that the course material that has been adopted by the faculty specifically for that course. So we do take some manual time in the beginning to make sure that it is the same edition. Another question is, uh, was the $250 the cost per title for unlimited access? Um, that is the cap for using their general funds dedicated to the AMP program, but that does not mean that we can't purchase with subject funds, higher cost eBooks um, outside of the AMP program. If it's unlimited seat, uh, we will add it to the AMP program for the promotion purposes and record that cost. Another question is why have you not tried going direct to publishers? We did do this in the beginning and it was extremely time consuming. Um, we had to get updated ebook lists available from each publisher. We had to determine um, the cost of those from the publisher. And if you buy multiple ebooks, it could be a greater discount. We had to determine which ebooks we were going to buy and then reach out to them directly to order them. And then the turnaround time is extremely slow. Gobi, we can have the links from some platforms within two hours. We really needed that extremely fast turnaround time to make sure that we were reaching students and faculty before the start of the semester. Um, and that has been um, uh, extremely appreciated by our students. Another question is, what is an example of a course in the sciences where AMP has been successful? I can address that. Uh, one of the titles where we had such high usage in one of those early semesters was actually from uh, a nursing class, which was using the Davis Drug Guide. Uh, so that actually was you know, just one of the top, the top titles for that semester. So that's just one example where that clearly worked really well for the students. Uh, but we do have a huge representation of, of courses and, and departments that are represented by the program. I, mean, I just did a, a report for uh, an engineering uh, accreditation where we showed how the AMP program supported engineering courses as well. So it really does um, you know, impact all different areas. And of course, the majority of the titles are these more monographic type non-traditional textbooks. So like you're not going to have you know, science textbooks per se, as it were. But when there is, there are materials that are available in e-format in the sciences and they, they match, we do certainly include them. And we do have a, a good number of them as well. Another question, I think you said that the AMP titles are linked to the LMS. How do they appear to students? Uh, I personally haven't seen uh, what, what it appears, but I believe that they are loaded in the individual course under, um, I think, documents or resources under that tab. I hope that answers your question. Um, and as a link, yeah. And I think we're out of questions. Well, that's good. I've pretty much wrapped up to our 30, 30 minutes or so. Uh, but we're happy to answer anything else that comes in, but I know everyone you know has other things for the day, but we do appreciate everyone's attention. It's uh, it's great to hear the feedback. And then, like I said, it's something we hope that people can bring to their institution in some way and build on the other efforts they might be doing. Obviously, having the relationship with the bookstore is a big piece of it uh, because that allows for much easier matching. Uh, but it's really been a great success for us. And we're really happy that uh, we could share it with everyone today. And we appreciate your feedback because we want to continue to improve our program every semester. Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone, and uh, hope to hear from anyone else in the future. Thanks. Thank you.